Section 5 of The Two Paths. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Todd Albrick. The Two Paths by John Ruskin. Section 5, Lecture 2. The Unity of Art. Part 2. Footnote. The portion of the lecture here omitted was a recapitulation of that part of the previous one which opposed conventional art to natural art. End of footnote. You may separate these two groups of artists more distinctly in your mind as those who seek for the pleasure of art in the relation of its colors and lines without caring to convey any truth with it, and those who seek for the truth first and then go down from the truth to the pleasure of color and line. Marking those two bodies distinctly as separate, and thinking over them, you may come to some rather notable conclusions respecting the mental dispositions which are involved in each mode of study. You will find that large masses of the art of the world fall definitely under one or the other of these heads. Observe pleasure first and truth afterwards, or not at all, as with the Arabians and Indians, or truth first and pleasure afterwards, as with Angelico and all other great European painters. You will find that the art, whose end is pleasure only, is preeminently the gift of cruel and savage nations, cruel in temper, savage in habits and conception, but that the art which is especially dedicated to natural fact always indicates a peculiar gentleness and tenderness of mind, and that all great and successful work of that kind will assuredly be the production of thoughtful, sensitive, earnest, kind men, large in their views of life, and full of various intellectual power. And farther, when you examine the men in whom the gifts of art are variously mingled, or universally mingled, you will discern that the ornamental or pleasurable power, though it may be possessed by good men, is not in itself an indication of their goodness, but is rather, unless balanced by other faculties, indicative of violence of temper, inclining to cruelty and to irreligion. On the other hand, so sure as you find any man endowed with a keen and separate faculty of representing natural fact, so surely you will find that man gentle and upright, full of nobleness and breadth of thought. I will give you two instances, the first peculiarly English, and another peculiarly interesting, because it occurs among a nation not generally very kind or gentle. I am inclined to think that, considering all the disadvantages of circumstances and education under which his genius was developed, there was perhaps hardly ever born a man with a more intense and innate gift of insight into nature than our own Sir Joshua Reynolds. Considered as a painter of individuality in the human form and mind, I think him, even as it is, the prince of portrait painters. Titian paints nobler pictures, and Van Dyck had nobler subjects, but neither of them entered so subtly, as Sir Joshua did, into the minor varieties of human heart and temper. Arid when you consider that with a frightful conventionality of social habitude all around him, he yet conceived the simplest types of all feminine and childish loveliness. That in a northern climate, and with grey and white and black as the principal colours around him, he yet became a colourist who can be crushed by none, even of the Venetians. And that with Dutch painting and Dresden china for the prevailing types of art in the saloons of his day, he threw himself at once at the feet of the great masters of Italy, and arose from their feet to share their throne. I know not that in the whole history of art you can produce another instance of so strong, so unaided, so unerring an instinct for all that was true, pure, and noble. Now, do you recollect the evidence respecting the character of this man, the two points of bright, peculiar evidence given by the sayings of the two greatest literary men of his day, Johnson and Goldsmith? Johnson, who, as you know, was always Reynolds' attached friend, had but one complaint to make against him, that he hated nobody. Reynolds, he said, you hate no one living. I like a good hater. Still more significant, 
is the little touch in Goldsmith's Retaliation. You recollect how in that poem he describes the various persons he met at one of their dinners at St. James's Coffee House, each person being described under the name of some appropriate dish. You will often hear the concluding lines about Reynolds quoted, He shifted his trumpet, etc. Less often, or at least less attentively, the preceding ones, far more important. Still born to improve us in every part, His pencil, our faces, his manners, our heart and never the most characteristic touch of all near the beginning. Our dean shall be venison just fresh from the plains, our burke shall be tongue with a garnish of brains. To make out the dinner, full certain I am, that rich is anchovy, and Reynolds is lamb. The other painter whom I would give you, as an instance of this gentleness, is a man of another nation, on the whole, I suppose, one of the most cruel civilized nations in the world, the Spaniards. They produced but one great painter, only one, but he among the very greatest of painters, Velazquez. You would not suppose, from looking at Velazquez's portrait generally, that he was an especially kind or good man. You perceive a peculiar sternness about them, for they were as true as steel, and the persons whom he had to paint, being not generally kind or good people, they were stern in expression, and Velazquez gave the sternness, but he had precisely the same intense perception of truth, the same marvellous instinct for the rendering of all natural soul and all natural form that our Reynolds had. Let me then read you his character as it is given by Mr. Sterling of Keir. Certain charges, of what nature we are not informed, brought against him after his death, made it necessary for his executor, Fuenzalida, to refute them at a private audience granted to him by the king for that purpose. After listening to the defence of his friend, Philip immediately made answer, I can believe all you say of the excellent disposition of Diego Velazquez. Having lived for half his life in courts, he was yet capable both of gratitude and generosity, and in the misfortunes he could remember the early kindness of Olivares. The friend of the exile of Loeches, it is just to believe that he was also the friend of the all-powerful favourite of Buen Retiro. No mean jealousy ever influenced his conduct to his brother artists. He could afford not only to acknowledge the merits, but to forgive the malice of his rivals. His character was of that rare and happy kind in which high intellectual power is combined with indomitable strength of will and a winning sweetness of temper, and which seldom fails to raise the possessor above his fellow men, making his life a laurelled victory and smooth success be strewed before his feet. I am sometimes accused of trying to make art too moral, yet observe I do not say in the least that in order to be a good painter you must be a good man, but I do say that in order to be a good natural painter there must be strong elements of good in the mind, however warped by other parts of the character. There are hundreds of other gifts of painting which are not at all involved with moral conditions, but this one, the perception of nature, is never given but under certain moral conditions. Therefore, now you have it in your choice. Here are your two paths for you. It is required of you to produce conventional ornament, and you may approach the task as the Hindu does, and as the Arab did, without nature at all, with the chance of approximating your disposition somewhat to that of the Hindus and Arabs, or as Sir Joshua and Velazquez did, with not the chance but the certainty of approximating your disposition according to the sincerity of your effort to the disposition of those great and good men. And do you suppose you will lose anything by approaching your conventional art from this higher side? Not so. I called, with deliberate measurement of my expression, long ago, the decoration of the Alhambra detestable, not merely because indicative of base conditions of moral being, but because merely as decorative work, However captivating in some respects, it is wholly wanting in the real, deep, and intense qualities of ornamental art. 
noble conventional decoration belongs only to three periods. First, there is the conventional decoration of the Greeks, used in subordination to their sculpture. There are then the noble conventional decoration of the early Gothic schools, and the noble conventional arabesque of the great Italian schools. All these were reached from above, all reached by stooping from a knowledge of the human form. Depend upon it, you will find, as you look more and more into the matter, that good subordinate ornament has ever been rooted in a higher knowledge. And if you are again to produce anything that is noble, you must have the higher knowledge first, and descend to all lower service. Condescend as much as you like. Condescension never does any man any harm. But get your noble standing first. So then, without any scruple, whatever branch of art you may be inclined as a student here to follow, whatever you are to make your bread by, I say, so far as you have time and power, make yourself first a noble and accomplished artist. Understand at least what noble and accomplished art is, and then you will be able to apply your knowledge to all service whatsoever. I am now going to ask your permission to name the masters whom I think it would be well if we could agree, in our schools of art in England, to consider our leaders. The first and chief I will not myself presume to name. He shall be distinguished for you by the authority of those two great painters of whom we have just been speaking, Reynolds and Velazquez. You may remember that in your Manchester Art Treasures exhibition the most impressive things were the works of those two men. Nothing told upon the eye so much, and no other pictures retained it with such a persistent power. Now, I have the testimony first of Reynolds to Velazquez, and then of Velazquez to the man whom I want you to take as the master of all your English schools. The testimony of Reynolds to Velazquez is very striking. I take it from some fragments which have just been published by Mr. William Cotton, precious fragments of Reynolds' diaries, which I chanced upon luckily as I was coming down here. For I was going to take Velazquez's testimony alone, and then fell upon this testimony of Reynolds to Velazquez, written most fortunately in Reynolds' own hand. You may see the manuscript. What we are all, said Reynolds, attempting to do with great labor, Velazquez does at once. Just think what is implied when a man of the enormous power and facility that Reynolds had, says he was trying to do with great labor what Velazquez did at once. Having thus Reynolds' testimony to Velazquez, I will take Velazquez's testimony to somebody else. You know that Velazquez was sent by Philip of Spain to Italy to buy pictures for him. He went all over Italy, saw the living artists there, and all their best pictures when freshly painted, so that he had every opportunity of judging, and never was a man so capable of judging. He went to Rome and ordered various works of living artists, and while there he was one day asked by Salvatore Rosa what he thought of Raphael. His reply and the ensuing conversation are thus reported by Buscini in curious Italian verse, which, thus translated by Dr. Donaldson, is quoted in Mr. Sterling's Life of Velazquez. The master, Velazquez, stiffly bowed his figure tall, and said, For Raphael to speak the truth, I always was plain-spoken from my youth. I cannot say I like his works at all. Well, said the other, Salvatore, if you can run down so great a man, I really cannot see. What you can find to like in Italy, to him we all agree to give the crown. Diego answered thus, I saw in Venice the true test of the good and beautiful. First in my judgment ever stands that school, and Titian first of all Italian menace. Tizian ze quel di porta la bandiera. Learn that line by heart and act, at all events for some time to come, upon Velasquez's opinion in that matter. Titian is much the safest master for you. Raphael's power, such as it characters in his mind it is raphaelesque properly so called but titian's power is simply the power of doing right whatever came before titian he did wholly as it ought to be done 
Do not suppose that now, in recommending Titian to you so strongly, and speaking of nobody else tonight, I am retreating in any wise from what some of you may perhaps recollect in my works. The enthusiasm with which I have always spoken of another Venetian painter. There are three Venetians who are never separated in my mind, Titian, Veronese, and Tintoret. They all have their own unequalled gifts, and Tintoret especially has imagination and depth of soul, which I think renders him indisputably the greatest man. But, equally indisputably, Titian is the greatest painter, and therefore the greatest painter who ever lived. You may be led wrong by Tintoret, footnote, see Appendix 1, right and wrong, and footnote, in many respects, wrong by Raphael in more. All that you learn from Titian will be right. Then, with Titian, take Leonardo, Rembrandt, and Albert Dürer. I name those three masters for this reason. Leonardo has powers of subtle drawing, which are peculiarly applicable in many ways to the drawing of fine ornament, and are very useful for all students. Rembrandt and Dürer are the only men whose actual work of hand you can have to look at. You can have Rembrandt's etchings or Dürer's engravings actually hung in your schools, and it is a main point for the student to see the real thing and avoid judging of masters at second hand. As, however, in obeying this principle, you cannot often have opportunities of studying Venetian painting, it is desirable that you should have a useful standard of color, and I think it is possible for you to obtain this. I cannot, indeed, without entering upon ground which might involve the hurting the feelings of living artists, state exactly what I believe to be the relative position of various painters in England at present with respect to power of color. But I may say this, that in the peculiar gifts of color, which will be useful to you as students, there are only one or two of the pre-Raphaelites and William Hunt of the old watercolor society who would be safe guides for you. And as quite a safe guide, there is nobody but William Hunt, because the pre-Raphaelites are all more or less affected by enthusiasm and by various morbid conditions of intellect and temper. But old William Hunt, I am sorry to say old, but I say it in a loving way, for every year that has added to his life has added also to his skill. William Hunt is as right as the Venetians, as far as he goes, and what is more, nearly as inimitable as they. And I think if we manage to put in the principal schools of England a little bit of Hunt's work, and make that somewhat of a standard of colour, that we can apply his principles of colouring to subjects of all kinds. Until you have had a work of his long near you, nay, unless you have been labouring at it and trying to copy it, you do not know the thoroughly grand qualities that are concentrated in it. Simplicity and intensity, both of the highest character. Simplicity of aim and intensity of power and success are involved in that man's unpretending labour. Finally, you cannot believe that I would omit my own favourite, Turner. I fear from the very number of his works left to the nation that there is a disposition now rising to look upon his vast bequest with some contempt. I beg of you, if in nothing else, to believe me in this, that you cannot further the art of England in any way more distinctly than by giving attention to every fragment that has been left by that man. The time will come when his full power and right place will be acknowledged. That time will not be for many a day yet. Nevertheless, be assured, as far as you are inclined to give the least faith to anything I may say to you, be assured that you can act for the good of art in England in no better way than by using whatever influence any of you have in any direction to urge the reverent study and yet more reverent preservation of the works of Turner. I do not say the exhibition of his works, for we are not altogether ripe for it. They are still too far above us, 
uniting, as I was telling you, too many qualities for us yet to feel fully their range and their influence. But let us only try to keep them safe from harm, and show thoroughly and conveniently what we show of them at all, and day by day their greatness will dawn upon us more and more, and be the root of a school of art in England which I do not doubt may be as bright as just and as refined as even that of venice herself the dominion of the sea seems to have been associated in past time with dominion in the arts also athens had them together venice had them together but by so much as our authority over the ocean is wider than theirs over the aegean or adriatic let us strive to make our art more widely beneficent than theirs though it cannot be more exalted, so working out the fulfillment in their wakening as well as their warning sense of those great words of the aged Tintoret, sempre si fa il mare maggiore. End of section 5 Recording by Todd Albrick